We now have a lot of backdrop laid to start talking about more complicated topics in quantum mechanics. We eventually would like to be able to have a way to describe how an electron moves around in a hydrogen atom. However, this is an extremely complex problem, even for the physicists who worked on the problem a very long time ago. So they started by using a model which instead took an electron and put it in a box that it couldn't get out of and let it move around within the box. This model is called the particle in the box model and allowed theoretical physicists to determine the methodology for calculating the exact movement of an electron in a hydrogen atom. This is where we are going to start today. We will start by defining a wave function, defining a particle in a box model, we'll then introduce the Schrodinger equation, and see how the energy levels are determined from the wave function in the Schrodinger equation. That part you won't be required to do as the math is beyond the scope of this class. First, I want to start with a sort of big picture overview of what's going to happen because this can get a little bit complicated. Extremely small particles have wave-like properties. We've discussed this in many of the previous videos. Waves can be described by equations. We haven't discussed that here, but you know what a wave looks like, and you know from math what sine and cosine and all of those functions are. So now, putting those two together, waves can be described by equations. From that, we can find the energy, and that's what we'll be doing in this video. Let's first look at the concept. In this little animation, letter A shows us what we would think of if we were thinking of an electron simply as a particle moving around in a box. We see it going back and forth in the box. However, we know that particles of this size are easily described by waves. They have much wave-like nature. So let's look at what that would look like. B through D shows us that, yet these aren't all the same. So what's the difference between them? Well, these are describing the different energy levels. We will go into this more when we start discussing the mathematics of the process, but for this slide, just see the differences and note that the more wavelengths you get within the length of the box, the higher the energy. For instance, in B, you only have one length over the whole box. That's lower energy than C, where you get two wavelengths, a lower energy than D, where you have three wavelengths. Now, if these are waves, then that means we should be able to describe them by an equation. And in fact, we can. This equation is called the wave function and is the equation that describes the movement of a particle. We use the symbol psi to denote this equation. Different particles are going to have different wave functions. So a particle in a box isn't described by the same wave function as a hydrogen electron is, or that a helium electron is. So the process we are going to step through today would have to be repeated for each new type of particle to find its properties. The setup for a particle in a box is that when you put an electron in between two walls of infinite potential energy, or in other words, the particle isn't allowed out. If you do this, only certain wavelengths are going to be allowed. An easy way to picture why this is, is to think about tying a jump rope on one end and then trying to make a standing wave pattern by moving the jump rope. You could also think of this as like a guitar string. If you do this, you'll see that you can make patterns above and nothing else. This brings us back to the idea of quantized energy. The electron is allowed to be of one particular set of energies and not in between. And once again, these are described by psi, or the wave function. Now let's introduce another quantity called psi squared. If psi is the wave function, then that means that to get psi squared, you simply square the wave function. The wave function itself doesn't have a physical interpretation. It is simply an equation that describes the wave. Psi squared does, though. It tells us 
the probability of finding a particle within a given space. Here, I have both the wave functions and the probability densities drawn out for the different energy levels of the particle in the box. Now let's look a bit closer and use an extremely simple example, one that really has no physical meaning it's so simple, but to get across the idea of what probability density could be used as for these more complex examples. Here we have an example of using the idea of a psi and psi squared, but because the wave functions are pretty complicated, we're going to do it for the simplest function possible, just a number. So let's say that we have a wave function, or we have a function that is equal to 0.44 centimeters cubed. We can graph that as just a simple straight horizontal line. Now, if we want to know the function of psi squared, we just square psi, which leaves us with 0.44 squared, or 0.2 centimeters cubed. We can graph this as well. If we want to know the probability of finding a particle, within three centimeters cubed, we would take the integral. Or for those of you who aren't in calculus, the area under the curve to find this value. In this case, up to three centimeters cubed. If we want to find that, because we can do this with a straight line pretty simply, we can do 0.2 times three centimeters cubed or a 60% chance of finding it within that area. Now, obviously this isn't an equation for an electron, but it does show you in it does show you how physicists and chemists are able to do these calculations so that when I flash up some formulas of the actual wave functions instead of just a regular function, you will understand a little bit better where they came from. Before we move on to that, let's answer some questions. It may be useful for you to pull up the slides of the probability density psi and psi squared so that you can look at these as you go to answer the questions. Psi is a function, so at any point can we absolutely determine the sign? Is the sign of psi always positive, always negative, or could it be both? If you look back on your chart, you can see that psi is a function and it's both positive and negative. So it can be either. What about psi squared? It's the square of psi. So it's the wave function times itself. What would the sign of that be? As it is a square, this has to always be positive because a positive times itself is positive and a negative times itself is a negative times a negative, which is also positive. Now let's talk about a special place that occurs in both the particle and the box model, as well as hydrogen and multi-electron atoms. A node occurs when psi is equal to zero. If psi is equal to zero, what is the probability density equal to? Since probability density is psi squared, it must also be zero. If psi squared is zero, what does that mean about the probability of an electron being found there? Since psi squared, or the area under this curve of psi squared, gives us the probability of finding an electron there, we can say that the probability of finding an electron at a node is equal to zero. Particle in the box wave functions will have a certain number of nodes that is always equal to n minus one. Now we need to talk about something called the Schrodinger equation. This is something that allows scientists to find both the wave function and the energy of the particles. We won't be doing any of the actual math, but you should have a basic understanding of how it exists and how scientists apply it. We'll do one example for those of you who have had calculus. It's not an exact example, but it'll help, under, help you understand it a little bit. This is actually a differential equation, and so the math goes beyond the scope of general chemistry material, and you can cover this in upper division chemistry courses. There are a couple of things that we can go through, though. 
First of all, what is the little hat on the H symbolic of? This says that H is an operator. An operator is something that operates on a function to yield a new function. It just changes the function a bit. Now let's look at what it gives us on the other side of the equation. If we have some operator and we operate on this function, we get back the same function, but now we have an energy level in front of it. This gives us our energy value. Just to illustrate the topic, let's put up an overly simplistic example that you can follow the math for that doesn't really require any differential equations or high level math. Then you can extrapolate and at least understand a bit of the idea behind what the scientists do to get the answers on the following slides in future podcasts. I will say that this concept is best explained with derivatives and I'm aware that some of you haven't had any calculus. I do apologize for using calculus here to help explain, but sometimes it just isn't avoidable. It's not testable though, so don't worry if you don't. However, if you have had even a little bit of calculus, please watch the next little bit to help you understand. If we have a function, let's say sine squared, or let's say sine of 2x, we could operate on it with a double derivative. So here my operator would be take the double derivative. Now just for fun, I put a negative in front of the double derivative too, so that we are doing a particularly well-known operator, but that's relatively unimportant. If we take the derivative of the sine minus 2x twice, you can see we get the function back. But now there is also a 4 out front. This would be our energy, or our eigenvalue. So again, just a brief example to show you how this works, even if it's not exactly how it's done in real life. Here, just for fun, I have put up the Hamiltonian of the particle in the box. If we solve this, remember it's a differential equation, then we can get both psi and e for the particle in the box. For those of you who know differential equations, give it a shot and see if you can figure it out before moving on. You'll have to look up psi from the book. However, this is absolutely not something that in any way would be required of you to solve. I'm just going to tell you the results of solving for the differential equations, and we'll use those. You can see how these can get quite complicated quite quickly, though. So now I'm going to magically wave my hands and solve the equation for both psi and e. Here we have the results of the solving the equation for both the wave function and the energy. We can use these to solve for the energy levels of the particle in the box. N is the energy level that we are solving for, and L is the length of the box. M is the mass of whichever particle we're talking about, so perhaps an electron or a proton or a neutron. And we can now simply fill everything in to the equation to get our energy levels. Let's do a quick example. Use the solution to the Schrodinger equation for a particle in the box to estimate the value of the energy of a ground state electron in a theoretical atom given that the approximate diameter of the atom is 100 picometers. So this would be an extremely rough model. It's not even extended to three dimensions, but we can still use it as a model for some things. And we'll start with our energy level that I gave you. I tell you that I want the first energy level, which gives us n equals 1, and I tell you that the size of the box is 100 picometers. We'll need to convert that into meters. Here I filled in my 1. I have filled in my picometers, converted into meters, and I can solve for my energy level. Let's do a quick recap, because this has been a very busy podcast. Wave functions are used to describe the movement of particles. If you square the wave function, you get a probability density. The wave function itself does not have any physical meaning. The probability density 
is used to determine the probability of an electron being found in a particular space. Using the Schrodinger equation, we, and here I use we to mean as humanity, not so much in this particular class, can solve for the, both the wave function and the energy levels of particles. We use the results of this to solve for the energy level of a model of an electron. We can now move on and see how this is done for the more complicated hydrogen atoms and the results that come from this. We have now defined a wave function, defined the particle in the box model, introduced the Schrodinger equation, and saw how the energy levels are determined from the wave function and the Schrodinger equation. This last one of which you are not required to replicate.